Hi, I'm Steve Hassan, and I'm delighted to have my friend, colleague, uh, Mark O'Donnell with me again for a conversation about uh, Leaving Neverland, the HBO documentary about Michael Jackson that features the abuse of two specific people who uh, were children and uh, told their story over four hours, and then was later interviewed on an Oprah special on HBO as well. And when I watched it, I reached out to Mark. It's been a while since we've been able to get this scheduled, but as a former member of the Watchtower, someone who's intimately uh, following all, all kinds of legal cases involving the Watchtower and ped the pedophilia, um, uh, uh, history uh, of the Watchtower. Mark, I'm going to introduce you right now and let you <laughs> talk about it. Um, but I just feel so strongly that that documentary missed the Jehovah's Witness connection. And I don't even think they mentioned it whatsoever. And I wanted to connect those dots and also talk about a bit more about the, the patterns of a predator a pedophile, how they groom. And so this will be an interesting conversation. Thanks, Mark, for taking the time. Well, thank you, Steve. It's uh, great to be here again, and it's always nice to chat with you. And uh, I really want to get your perspective on some things uh, that deal with uh, coercive control or undue influence over uh, people. Because I think a lot of these abuse cases that I cover um, have a very strong element of um, uh, especially male dominated control within a closed society or an insular society, which is what Jehovah's Witnesses are. Mm -hmm. I grew up in that environment. And uh, so, you know, you mentioned the HBO special and uh, it's been a while since, since I've watched it myself, but I did watch the entire special when it came out and you know, it's received uh, some rave reviews and some mixed reviews. And it's it's a really a hot button issue because uh, there's a lot of controversy surrounding why would these two men, after so many years, come out with these allegations against uh, this, you know, famous performer. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's interesting that the program itself just focuses on the two men. I believe it was Robson and Safechuck. Uh, one from Australia, one from the United States, who became part of Michael Jackson's inner circle. And uh, they have um, previously made statements, uh, I think even some of them during Michael Jackson's trial, that kind of contradicted what they're saying now. And, and that's an interesting point, uh, Steve, that I would like to ask you about, because what, when we study these child abuse cases, one thing's for sure is that you don't always get the information about an abuser from the victim, especially if the victim's a child or very young, right. on the first interview. And police detectives will tell you this, investigators will tell you this, and then you have it coupled with the fact that this man is a you know, multi-platinum, uh, hundred millionaire or billionaire, I don't know how much his estate is worth now, but you have uh, you know, probably one of the most famous entertainers to have ever lived. And then you have the fact that he was around so many children and now these men are making these allegations. So you can understand why it uh, creates this conflict in the mind of people who, who absolutely love Michael Jackson. Uh, but then on the other hand, you have whether or not we should believe these men. And is there a reason why they changed their story or uh, perceptively changed their story according to what we're hearing? Sure, and I, I, I guess I want to jump in and say that um, I found the, the, the tone and the whole manner of the documentary to be so factual and so filled with archival footage and interviews with people who were in the family and, and in the circles. Um, I found myself, you know, you know, I'm not speaking as an expert witness, but I'm saying as a, a viewer and someone who has helped people in cults and who've been victimized by child sexual abusers and pedophiles, I found their stories to be highly credible. 
and their explanations for how they came to have nervous breakdowns, be in therapy, even disclose to their wives, uh, particularly I think it was, was uh, Wade who um, had a child and as the child was getting to the age when he was abused, uh, I've seen that pattern over and over again with my clients where their love of their own children and the fact that they're an adult now and having that perspective, they could see just how vulnerable the children were versus the subjective point of view uh, when, they, when they were children. So I, I found it very credible, and, but I was disturbed that um, you know, the whole mind control, grooming, how predators act, people who are malignant narcissists act, and the connection to what I, uh, and you were a major uh, educator of mine, Mark, in terms of just the vast conspiracy of the Watchtower, knowing, having a list of over 20,000 uh, pedophiles at their headquarters, uh, and, and how they were not reporting these people to the police, not protecting children, demanding right. to witness rule as a, as a, as a, uh, an, an errant interpretation of a biblical scripture. Um, and I just felt like we should really connect the dots with the Watchtower and their huge uh, uh, victimization of countless people as children. And my perception also as a, as a mental health professional that pedophiles are not born, uh, they're made. And so my understanding is that uh, it may not be everyone that we can prove was a victim of child sexual abuse who became a, a, a pedophile, but the overwhelming number, clearly we can point back to, they were victimized, they, became, they identified with the victimizer and started victimizing others and doing mind control on others as it had been done on them. I think there's a lot of truth to that, that you, you do have a lot of reoffenders, of persons who were sexually assaulted uh, as a child, and that confuses them sexually. And uh, any proclivity that they have for that sickness of pedophilia uh, is exacerbated by the fact that they were abused so severely themselves, and then they pass this on uh, to their victims. So uh, this happens in, in an incredible amount of cases. It even happened in the um, Arkansas case in which I recently went to trial uh, last year for Roderick Watkins, who was given 80 years for abusing, you know, dozens of children. Now, only uh, 10 spoke to the police that we know of down in Arkansas, at least 10, but there's a whole lot more and there's more to that story. But uh, what What is key that I discovered in that case is that a, a man showed up to trial, an older man showed up to trial, and I found out through law enforcement later that this man's son actually uh, was, according to what police believe to be, the first victim of Roderick Watkins in Arkansas, and that son ended up um, uh, raping two people in the very county jail where Roderick Watkins was hauled off in handcuffs himself once convicted. So, Direct. I mean, the, yeah, yeah it's, it is just unbelievable. But, you know, getting back to your original comment about the connection with the witnesses, uh, Michael Jackson, for those that don't know this, he, he was raised by a Jehovah's Witness mother, a very devout Jehovah's Witness mom, I believe to this day, she's still a witness. Mm -hmm. And I also understand that his father was not or never was one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm -hmm. They grew up in Gary, Indiana, and I think the mom did the best she could to raise the children as devout witnesses. Ultimately, uh, the, you know, their dad really pushed them into the entertainment field. They, all, they ended up in California, or at least many of them did. A lot of the family members did. And basically, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses out in California sort of uh, took over from there and started looking out for Michael Jackson. I've met quite a number of them that uh, were elders or circuit overseers at the time who uh, went to the Jackson household. I remember uh, one Jehovah's Witness circuit overseer came to Baltimore for his first circuit and was telling me the story as we were driving out into the field ministry. And uh, he related a story to me about how he um, 
uh, was in the Jackson home when Michael still lived at home. Uh, it, this is in, I believe it was in California because he grew up there and he became a circuit overseer in California. And Michael was studying the Bible or this, uh, the circuit overseer was studying the Bible with uh, uh, one of the Jackson kids, um, including Michael, I believe at the time. And he goes up into the second floor and stumbles over this large pile of blankets and out comes Janet Jackson, who was just sleeping on the floor outside of her bedroom. And it was an interesting story, but it's, it goes to demonstrate that the, the witnesses really um, wanted those kids to have the Jehovah's Witness upbringing. But then you had the dad and, you know, all of the producers, the Quincy Jones of the world that were really trying to, uh, you know, I don't know if I want to use the word exploit, but that's, that is one word that, that mm -hmm. rings true. They wanted to exploit the talent of these incredibly talented young family members. And so I saw that this as a conflict, Jehovah, uh, Michael Jackson was baptized as one of Jehovah's witnesses where his story stops as a witness was 1987. And mm -hmm. that's the year that finally the, the, the battle that took place within his life between the Jehovah's Witness side and the non-witness entertainment side, that finally caved in and Michael Jackson disassociated himself. Mm -hmm. We don't fully know all of the reasons why he disassociated himself back in 1987. Um, what we do know is that, um, you know, that was, that was the end of his Jehovah's Witness career. But the vestiges of the Jehovah's Witness teachings went on long after that. In fact, I've seen interviews with Michael Jackson where he said, I don't celebrate birthdays. Yeah, that was in the, the Leaving Neverland yeah. documentary. And that was after 1987 that he right. stated that publicly. So, right. so this is kind of a question for you, Steve, is that you, know, you see that people that even have gotten away from cults, how often do you see the vestiges of that high control organization in their life after they leave the cult? Almost always, almost always. So I want to say, you know, you know, my work and my books, uh, combating cult mind control, etc., where I talk about the dissociative disorder of someone in a mind control cult where they're split from their authentic self and their cult self. And in, 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 in looking at the Michael Jackson story, there's this, this uh, additional self, this public persona entertainer self that does music, et cetera. So there, there was a split going on there. But I, I guess I want to say that unless somebody takes the time to learn about mind control, learn about cults, talk to former members, and leave the group for the right reasons, and these are air quotes, when I say the right reasons, not because they were kicked out of the group because they celebrated a birthday, or they were kicked out of the group because they had a sexual relationship with someone they weren't married, but somebody who leaves because, you know what, I, I believed because I thought they were following the Bible, and I learned that the Watchtower's Bible is not an accurate translation of the Bible as one possible thing. But the right. bigger piece for me is really understanding coercion and lack of informed consent and the bite model, behavior control, information control, thought and emotional control. We actually have a blog on my website about, about this model and the Jehovah's witnesses. Um, and so what is a dissociative disorder? It, think of it like uh, identities or think of it like roles. So there are different selves, but they're not connected. But having very early on, and I've, I've learned this from working with people who are in the watchtower, um, being told, shown graphic images of Armageddon and, and, right. and the, uh, death and destruction. And, 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 and only if you believe you'll be saved and everyone else is going to be burned up. And, and this paradise images, if you believe, and, 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 and hell, uh, hellish flames and, and destruction and the corporal punishment, which is done 
uh, by so many people in the watchtower, which is so detrimental and traumatic for young children. Um, unless, unless they get the proper specialized type of therapy, they're carrying that baggage forever. And especially there are so many people who are abused sexually uh, in the watchtower. Uh, this is a caution for them if they haven't seen Leaving Neverland that there really is graphic descriptions by the two men who are featured of step by step by step, you know, from the touching the knee, uh, give me a massage, you know, and as well as saying things like you can't tell anyone about this or right. you will be found guilty also. Um, and I and I did want to comment and I wanted to ask you to comment too about how predators, sexual predators often are grooming the parents and the family to get access to their children and how that's done in an incremental way. And maybe you can share. More. Yeah, that, that's a really, in fact, I was just thinking of that. Um, I, um, I've had a chance to chat with Diane Diamond, who is a uh, well-respected investigative journalist who actually wrote one of the original books, um, broke the story on Michael's Jackson, uh, Michael Jackson's alleged abuses years and years ago. And she attended the criminal trial and, you know, she's really an expert on the subject. Um, so she's done a lot of interviews. And, and one of the thing, one thing that struck me from one of her interviews was a quote where she said, they must first seduce the parent to get to the child. Right. And that really hit me because I investigate hundreds of Jehovah's Witness child sex abuse cases, many of them involving church elders, uh, ministerial servants or deacons, um, circuit overseers, which is, you know, a much higher, just below the governing body and branch committee. So the very high ranking individuals uh, that are very, very, very trusted individuals in the organization. And because they are so trusted and they have these positions where they maneuver themselves into what we call the service overseer or presiding overseer or coordinator of a local congregation, especially the parents that have, uh, let's say, fathers that are not witnesses or maybe they're divorced and a mom's raising her three kids, what they do by and large is they throw their kids at these men whether the men are married or not, who are elders, circuit overseers, et cetera, and say, you, you know, you need to be, you know, I need you badly to be a role model in my son's life mm. or my daughter's life. Uh, because these are the, the spiritual giants that they look up to, the examples, the men who will get them to go to Watchtower's Bethel headquarters or get them to pioneer or reach out for other responsibilities. So Michael Jackson's situation was very, very similar to that. These parents saw you know, this person, uh, you know, who could give an opportunity for their children. Uh, and so the parents were really the first ones to be groomed. And I think it's a cautionary tale for all parents to not let themselves get drawn in by church elders, by um, entertainment industry gurus or people that they would otherwise trust, because these people uh, are just as culpable, if not more, than the average rank and file person that you might think is a child molester so right right and i mean i i'm gonna mention a, a really important uh video and program for parents now called uh blink think choice voice uh that was put together by ira chaloff as a form of intelligent disobedience using guide dogs for the blind as an example where the dogs are trained to be obedient right. but then if their blind master is gonna walk into a street and get hit by a car, they disobey the command to, to move forward. This is something that's so important for all parents. And I, I think it's great for adults too, frankly, because adults can be taken over by sexual predators for sure. And right. the blinking and thinking, you know, this is this is weird that what this request is and understanding the incremental nature of mind control that it isn't uh, uh, usually a one time you know all or nothing thing that it takes it's groomed over weeks and months and sometimes even years um 
and uh, and parents have the responsibility to do the independent investigation to say no it's not okay to let my seven-year-old sleep in your bed even though you reassure me that it's fun and you're eating popcorn and watching movies right. it's not okay this is my child and um, and and not having to live with the regrets that the parents of these young men who are featured uh, you know have it would devastated it traumatized the entire family not just the young men when the truth did come out yeah I, I think it's a really good as I said before cautionary tale for parents to to stop and blink and think um, because what really causes these problems is when the parents are caught off guard they didn't see it coming and and look I'm not trying to um, um, misrepresent the the claims of any of these parents or say that they were uh, necessarily intentionally guilty of what they did but when they got so caught up in you know mentally distracted it's almost like the abusers create this illusion it's like an illusionist who makes you misdirects you and you're thinking in one direction but meanwhile an abuser or a manipulator comes in behind and gets what he or she wants without you realizing that it's either happening to you or happening to your children. Yeah, I was listening to an interview with Rachel Denhollander, who exposed Larry Nasser, who was the gymnastics uh, doctor oh, yeah. who abused so many of our, our, of our top gymnasts. And, you know, he would literally have the parent in the room would would be talking about the weather or talking about you know uh, life events while he was molesting the children right with the parents it's... in the room and the disconnect you know where the kids are being told he's a he's an authority figure he's doing right. what's ne necessary to help me be the best gymnast i can be and yet their own bodies were saying this isn't right this is not okay, but it was, you know, confusion. And, and the, the key to mind controlling people is creating confusion. And as you were saying, there's misdirection, yeah. there's distraction. And frankly, you know, Michael Jackson, you know, said to the parents of one of the boys, I get what I want. Like he, he actually said it. And when, when, whenever you hear somebody say, <laughs> You know, I always get what I want, especially if they're a celebrity or powerful. You know, red flag, red flag, run, run in the other direction. Yeah, what you described is is horrifying in the case of you know children like with Larry Nasser that were abused right in the same room with the parents. That same scenario played out almost exactly in the case of this Roderick Watkins, the elder who's now serving 80 years, mm -hmm. uh, the Jehovah's Witness elder, he, a number of his victims testified that uh, he had them on his lap uh, in a room full of uh, witnesses at his own home where he had control of the circumstances. And, uh, you know, he would even, uh, a lot of these abusers do things like turn, turn the heat up or down a lot of times they'll turn it down so that they have to use a blanket and then they get a child on their lap and then they put a blanket over top, which is what happened with Watkins. And he started sexually molesting uh, these children underneath of a blanket with their parents in the room. Uh, and he even did it to older teens uh, at, at parties in the kitchen with the dad in the room. I mean, just the, the stuff that came out at trial is exactly, is exactly what you're describing there with, with Nasser. So back to the story in, in Leaving Neverland. Uh, so for me, there's no controversy that there, the abuse took place, uh, but there's a disconnect for people who love Michael Jackson's songs and music, who, who attended his concerts because it was such a high, it was so fun and so, so uplifting and great. But to understand that reality is not all black and white and, and, and people can be incredible talents and have a dark part of their psyche that is harming people. 
uh, for their own uh, aggrandizement, for their own pleasure. Um, and, and when it comes to children, they must be protected. And, um, and, and I also want to just state, because I mentioned the Larry Nasser, that was abuse of women or girls. Right. But this was an example of, in my opinion, two brave men who were willing to go public, neither were gay, uh, who were molested by a gay uh, or bisexual Michael Jackson. Uh, at least that was the portrayal that I saw. And, and so it was very brave of them to say, you know what, uh, he did this, he did this, he did this. And, and one of them even talked about how painful it was when he was, was uh, attempted to be penetrated uh, anally by Michael Jackson. And, you know, Michael was disappointed and wanted him to get over it. And when he, when he complained, he was no longer right. in the inner circle and Jackson went on to to victimize others, unfortunately. Yeah, so he used that power, that control that he had in order to manipulate them. And I don't think there's any doubt that the abuse occurred, but I will say, to be fair, yeah. there's lots of people who object to that, including uh, the estate of Michael Jackson. And so I do recommend that people watch both sides of the issue. Watch that second documentary that came out, I think, um, uh, let's see. I don't have a date on that, but there was a second documentary that came out following HBO's leaving Never, Never, Neverland. <laughs> and I want people to see and, and understand both sides. But at the end of the day, it really comes down to a lot of the work that you do because the child abuse, look, th there's no one with videotapes of Michael Jackson abusing a child, right? So it comes down to sort of the, the psychology of, are these people lying? Do they have motive for lying? would they come forward and tell the most intimate and horrific details of their life if it weren't true? Are they getting money for it? Um, all of these things are important questions. Mm -hmm. But as I think you mentioned before, all of the patterns of all of the victims who testified completely match the profile of a pedophile. And, and I encourage people to read um, books. For example, that's one of the first things I learned when I talked with Diane Diamond is to talk to the FBI profilers. Uh, there's an FBI profiler who wrote an entire book on child molesters. I don't have a copy of the book in front of me here, but read those and understand those because as much as we want to believe that these individuals, these elders or these uh, superstars like Michael Jackson are innocent, we, we have to accept the fact that they may not be innocent and that they may be living this duality, this double life where they seem innocent on the surface it's all about the children. It's all about Neverland. It's all about, uh, you know, singing songs of positivity. But there is a very, very dark side to that. And I think you probably see that a lot in your work. And, and I did want to ask you, uh, and we talked about this offline a little bit, about, um, the, you know, the effect that uh, Michael Jackson's father, in this case, was not a witness. And he seemed to have a very strong control and so did the mom but because you know because of this the male centric now he wasn't a witness but he you know the question to you steve is uh, what factor in this split household one being a witness one not what factor did the fact that michael jackson's dad was um controlling him in a direction that ultimately led him out of the religion what what role do you think that played? Yeah, no, I think it's huge. And like many um, other Bible-oriented groups, some legitimate and some destructive cults, the Watchtower teaches them the male is the head of the household and a, a good wife should submit and obey. And I would have to imagine that if, if uh, the male, the father was in and the mother was out, they would have been divorced and the kids would have been raised in the watchtower is, is, you know, one thing that I would say. Um, so it might be fair to say that the mom being, even though her husband wasn't a witness, being a uh, typically submissive Jehovah's Witness wife may have led to her not possibly not being able to fully protect her children the way that uh, a mother with an equal standing with her husband might. 
Yeah, that's one part of it. But I have to wonder if I was a leader in the Watchtower and one of my uh, uh, people's son was a famous star and, and, and was bringing in a lot of money that I would be wanting to ask for money <laughs> to for the organization. And when we were chatting before, you told, told me a little bit about Prince and uh right yeah so yeah and i can mention that um you know we know a little bit more about prince in terms of his relationship with the jehovah's witnesses because unlike michael jackson prince died as a faithful baptized jehovah's witness and they even gave him a funeral at the kingdom hall in minneapolis where he lived mm -hmm. so he had a very public connection to the jehovah's witnesses was very close friends with larry graham who introduced him uh, to the religion. Larry Graham is a, uh, you know, famous musician in his own right. Mm. So I think uh, in the case of Prince, we have, um, we have physical evidence in terms of documents that show that he had donated a fairly sizable amount of money to Watchtower. We don't know the extent of it, but we do have documentation that there was a lot of money transferred. But in the case of Michael Jackson, I'm not aware of that same, I'm quite certain that he did, as as you know the devout uh -huh. witness he was up until 1987 but um you you know you raise a really good point um and and the the truth of the matter is and, and i've learned this from those that are privately investigating the case is that there are allegations against michael jackson i want to make it clear for legal reasons these are just allegations right against michael jackson of among those who were Jehovah's Witnesses or Jehovah's Witness children at the time, he was still a witness. So that means from 1987 and before. Uh -huh. The problem is that uh, many of these children have disappeared. One is dead, one was homeless, uh, the other four couldn't be located, even though the investigators who are looking into this had some evidence of allegations. So. The only thing I'll say about that is that if there were allegations, they would exist in Watchtower's um, pedophilia database or child, child abuse database that they maintain in New York. Yeah, that, and, that we and know. there may be more people walking around with more uh, information that could be very helpful and valuable. Yeah, I'd like to circle back, if I may, before we finish, Mark, and just talk about some of the other elements that I saw in watching the Leaving Neverland. And um, my understanding of the Watchtower ideology is that after Armageddon, er, the people who are faithful are going to live forever on Earth with lots of animals, and everyone's going to be, you know, in total harmony. And it seemed to me like Jackson was recreating that in his estate. And I yes. also had read something where he was into oxygen chambers in order to try to extend his, his longevity and such. Yeah, so, well, I'll address that one first. Uh, and I'm not aware of any witnesses who think that way as far as the oxygen chamber. And I really think that he was influenced in that way by external sources, not by the Jehovah's oh, Witnesses. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. But the idea of, the idea was in his head as a child that he would live forever if he was with Jehovah as a good yeah, I, I think you you bring up a very, very good point is that, um, you know, his music at the time he was still a witness was very much influenced by his Jehovah's Witness upbringing and, uh, you know, saving the world and saving the children and, um, you know, living in idealistic or utopian surroundings. Um, and then he create later he created this Neverland Ranch. Mm -hmm. And he sort of combined all the elements of paradise. He had, you know, an, an entire zoo right. at his estate. And so, and, and he used that to draw children in. And, you know, this is not normal behavior of someone who is, you know, mentally all there. I mean, it, it, you and I would never create a, an environment where we would attract children to come and stay with us without their parents it is extremely unhealthy. And he should have known that it was very dangerous as an entertainer to have any children around him that were not his own children. It's, it's like suicide to do that because you can, you know, all sorts of things can go wrong. Even if a person is not attracted to children as he clearly was. So 
you know, really, really, really bad choices at the very, very best. But as we know, at worst, we have allegations. And I'd like to also say that, um, you know, what the HBO series didn't really go into a, a great deal was some of the other, there were lots of other allegations. There were, uh, there were some cases that were settled to the tune of 25 and $30 million before this other, why would an individual settle for that amount of money if that person was truly innocent? I understand, you know, maybe there's some allegations about something and a few thousand dollars and it goes away. But, you know, when they have serious evidence to the point where somebody is willing to give up 25, 30 million dollars or more, you've and got to- as a profile, as you say, and I'm not familiar with the book by the FBI profiler, but we'll dig it up and we'll put it in the blog. But the, the, the people who have a sexual addiction, people who are pedophiles, repeat over and over and over again the pattern. And the pattern is often one of power over versus uh, uh, true sexual uh, gratification and pleasure. And it's often this pattern that I've identified as a mental health professional of of of, of identifying with the aggressor and then you becoming the aggressor. So you've been victimized and then you seek out victims because that gives you the power that you didn't have when you were victimized. And it's, it's a very, you know, distorted um, worldview, but it, it, it is uh, my experience that people do things to try to, heal to try to address the traumas and the problems that they had earlier in their life. One of the questions that uh, journalist Diane Diamond was asked was, well, you know, why do the Michael Jackson children, at least at the time, early, earlier in their life before they started having uh, trouble, why were they so normal? They haven't been abused, you know, and, and this is true of many other uh, abusers who have children. Well, if they're abusing other kids, why, you know, why don't we see their own children making these allegations? So the, the quote that she said when she was interviewed was that it's very rare for an abuser to turn on their own children. Mm. In, instead, they turn on other children and it's almost like they compartmentalize their abuse and they maybe they think they know they can't get away with it with their own children but because of the control and manipulation they have, maybe it's a position in the congregation, maybe it's their stardom and fame, they, they kind of compartmentalize that section of their life and they're able to manipulate the circumstances. Maybe they feel uh, that they're, they're worth less, these other children, they're worth less than their own children. So- Yeah, it's an interesting question. I would hypothesize that that may be more of a feature of being in an authoritarian cult-like group where people are gonna tell on you if they're aware of a sin that's taking place. But I can tell you, you know, in my work that many people abuse their own children, unfortunately, if they were abused. Oh yeah, and, and I don't wanna imply that they don't. Right. Uh, I guess in the context of Michael Jackson, the right. reason I'm bringing that up is because one of the early questions that was asked of him is, well, you know, why don't, why don't your own kids say that they were abused? And, and for all I know, they could be. Uh, but her point uh, was that in his case, um, she believed that he was turning on other children, not his own. But we really don't, honestly, we don't know, you know, because a lot, a lot of this, most all of this happens behind closed doors and we have to use, you know, profiling and psychology to understand it. Right. Which brings me to uh, the book I mentioned. I just found it. Mm -hmm. um, it's called Love Bombs and Molesters, an FBI's Journey, and it's written by Kenneth Lanning. It, it's available on Amazon. I have a copy in my library, just not in front of me, but it's called mm -hmm. Love Bombs and Molesters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you about that. And I guess I also want to comment because I watched Oprah Winfrey's special um, on HBO where she interviewed um, Wade and James and uh, I think Dan Reed was the filmmaker. Right. And in the audience were people who had been abused. Many were men. Uh, who had been abused as children and who were, had not spoken out, many of them. And um, 
and, and, and just to validate what a positive, from my point of view, effort it was for these young men, for this filmmaker to tell the story, to dare to tell the story about one of the most iconic legends in, in modern music. Um, but for the sake of protecting our children and for the sake of helping those who had been traumatized as children and wanting them to heal. And we, we really do believe that sharing these traumas is a step towards healing, whereas trying to compartmentalize it, deny it, it comes, the problems come out in all kinds of ways, alcoholism, suicidal attempts, uh, uh, drug use, uh, risk behaviors, etc. cetera. Um, and so, and then lastly, I just want to uh, add a, a, a therapeutic strategy, if I may, uh, use with my clients and helping them to heal from traumas that I, I would love to convey to, to James and Wade, which is that um, really learning about mind control in the here and now, and then when you think back to what happened earlier, to know the difference between uh, an associated memory and a dissociated memory, meaning that when you remember it, you're not back in the trauma, that you still are able to maintain a kind of meta position looking at the younger you who is Interesting. being molested so that it doesn't re-traumatize you. That's one important technique and strategy. And then the other one is... Um, because I listened to it over and over again and from his, uh, their family members as well, you know, I wish I had known, you know, or I feel really guilty because I didn't X or Y or Z. What I tell my, my clients is the, the healthiest strategy is to say, if I knew then what I know now, if I could go back in time to critical moments what would I have said, said and done differently? And in the case of mo the mom asking, did anything go on with you and Michael of a sexual nature? I would predict that James and Wade, knowing what they know now, would have said, mom, he's touching me, you know, or he's doing this or he's doing that. And, and the abuse wouldn't have gone on for years. They wouldn't have been pressured to go to court to, to lie under oath, um, you know, and say nothing happened, etc. And, and, and really, we're human beings, we're not perfect. And we, we can be unduly influenced by, you know, a famous person who's giving us gifts, and, and flattering us and making us feel special. Um, but knowing what we know now to go back and, and, and realize, you know, out of integrity, I would have stopped it, no matter what, what the pluses might have looked like at that time. Yeah, it, it almost sounds to me like uh, those, those uh, great techniques and advice that you're giving would be terrific in a book addressed to parents so that they can ask those questions and make sure that they communicate properly with their children when they're that age. Because as you pointed out, if, if, if those questions are never brought up, it seems that they, they may get swept under the rug and abuses will happen. And then look, look what happens 20, 30, 40 years later when, you know, alcoholism, suicide, and these stories start coming out, when other children start coming forward and, th and that's what I think I've learned more than anything about these child abuse cases is the fact that um, sadly the worst, you know, the worst you can imagine is often the case because what happens in private with one child is replicated over and over again with other children that that predator had access to. So, you know, it's, it's, it's all about prevention. And, you know, I think that you were, uh, your your books like Combative Cult, Mind Control, and the blogs on the site may be very helpful to people, especially parents, mm -hmm. um, who can help kind of prevent that coercion um, of their own children and themselves before it's too late. Right. 
And, and, you know, in retrospect, 2020 hindsight, uh, to yeah. understand these techniques that, that a predator is going to say to the, to the child, you know, you seduced me. You were so cute. I, you had, I had no Victor power, Amy. you know, but for parents to explain some of the tricks and the techniques that predators use and definitely a hundred percent. I want to encourage any parent to say to their children, no matter what age they are, that if any stranger tries to put up a wall and tell you not to trust me as your father or, you know, as your mother, uh, red flags should be going off because we're family and we love you. And this is a stranger. Even if the stranger says that they love you and the, or the strangers, you know, mix up all kinds of stories of that parents are in a satanic cult and are, you know, killing babies. Right. They're a stranger, <laughs> you know, we're a family. So communication, open communication, mom, dad, so-and-so told me this story. What's the deal with that? And, and always keep that, that communication open. Great advice. And, and with that, I want to thank you so much, Mark. You've helped so many people wake up. You've helped uh, uh, so many people who've been hurt to get uh, the, the justice that they're seeking. We have a lot more to do. And as we're wrapping up, I'd just like you to explain the statute of limitations uh, decision in New York City as it pertains, I mean, New York State, State as it pertains to the Watchtower. As we wrap up? Yeah. So, uh, well, last August, uh, Governor Cuomo, actually, it was over a year ago, I think January of 2019, Governor Cuomo signed the Child Victims Act uh, legislation, which then started in August of 2019, and it's for one year. So what it is, it's a one-year civil litigation statute of limitations extension where all of these cases in which uh, either the the crimes took place in New York or it was covered up by an organization centered in New York, uh, those victims, even if it's 20 or 30 years ago or 40 years ago, they have an opportunity to seek civil justice under the Child Victims Act law. And that means in Watchtower's case that theoretically since Watchtower is uh, their control, they're a hierarchical organization that's governed from New York. Uh, they tell all of the elders uh, what to do, whether to call the police or not, whether to uh, disfellowship a person, all of those things take place in New York. So uh, theoretically, what, what can happen there is that the uh, victims and their attorneys can seek justice in the state of New York under the Child Victims Act law for crimes that previously they, you know, you and I both know that uh, the average age of a child or a victim coming forward with their story of abuse is often 50 or more years. And you can talk to Marcy Hamilton and uh, uh, her organization that will explain that average age. The victim. Yeah, childusa.org. And I have a blog about Marcy on my website. Terrific. Talking about her work to lift. Uh, statutes of limitations. The important thing is to realize that uh, there are possibilities in the legal system to find justice, even if the, the crime ha took place more than a few years previous. Yes, and in other states as well, not just New York. New York okay. is significant for Jehovah's Witnesses because their organization is headquartered Got in it. New York. But other states have opened up the one-year window also. For example, following the Nunez case that you and I have talked about in Montana, that was a trial that took place back in 2018, and then the Supreme Court of Montana ruled on that a year later, well, that case resulted in some changes in legislation. And one change in legis legislation that has happened is that I, I believe it was Governor Bullock that signed uh, an SOL legislation that was for one year. And that actually just ended, I think it was May 6th. Today is May 12th. So a lot of victims of child sexual abuse were able to file civil lawsuits in including two very, very big cases that have just been filed right before the deadline in Montana 
nothing to do with the original Montana case, but it's a case that we don't have time to talk about today, but it's so heinous that it involves multiple Jehovah's Witness elders, ministerial servants, uh, circuit overseers, all who knew about the, this, what the investigators are calling a child abuse ring or a pedophile ring that went on with the knowledge of these elders Mm. And potentially what we're understanding is that Watchtower's headquarters knew about it. And because they exercise what they believe to be their right to keep allegations internal, they've just basically covered that up within their child abuse, child abuse database in New York. And so now we have two very significant uh, lawsuits that have been filed. It may take years to adjudicate, but... I'm just happy for the victims that have finally, you know, some of them are, are a lot older now, yeah. but they're finally able to get justice, tell their stories. And then that in turn empowers other victims in other states to like what happened in the Larry Nasser case. You have a yeah. few that came forward and then what hundreds came forward and very uh, high profile, you know, uh, Simone Biles, Ali Raisman, other people broke their silence and said, yep, me too. Yeah. So I want to thank you, Mark, so much for your good work. And thanks to your beloved wife, Kimmy, who's been fantastic uh, uh, support uh, to the efforts to spread the word of uh, cult mind control and freedom of mind. So Thanks again, Mark. Thank you. And for your great work, Steve, I know you're working pretty hard right now. So uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk again about uh, maybe a more pleasant subject, but uh, you know, cats. Uh, I know you're into cats. <laughs> yeah. And fortunately uh, cats are, are generally not involved in cult mind control. So they're an easy one to talk about, but yeah, no, I, I really do appreciate Except you. For the Tiger King show that's on Netflix. Oh yeah. Well, that's a whole nother show in itself, isn't that's it? That's a different cat thing. Yeah. Great to talk with you. Thanks. Likewise.